This is Ag Grad Live. We have all of the different segments within the cotton. The show that explores what it's really like to work in the ag industry. So making sure that we get policy and regulatory issues. Straight from the people who live it every day. Hey, happy Tuesday, everybody. This is my favorite time of the week in Ag Grad Live. It's our chance where we get to sit down uh, with one of the recipients of the Ag Grad 30 Under 30 Award and just learn a little bit more about them, about their background, about the work they do, and uh, the insights this is bringing about agriculture and the future of agriculture, I think have been uh, really, really exciting. Um, this is maybe the seventh or so one we've done, uh, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, my name is Tim Hamrich. I'm founder of AgGrad, and uh, I get the pleasure of, of having these conversations. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring on this week's guest. We have the COO of Versant Strategies on the show, Caleb Wright. Caleb, welcome to AgGrad Live. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's a true honor to be with you. And you are in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Is that right? I am. I am. State capital of Pennsylvania. Very cool. Well, tell us about Versant Strategies, about uh, what, what you all do and the types of clients that you serve. Yeah, of course. So Versant, Snat Versant Strategies, excuse me, is um, a government relations public affairs firm with a specialization in agricultural, environmental, education, and, and straight up rural affairs. Um, we're a small shop um, in the grand scheme of lobbying firms, working with a, kind of a close knit team, um, but we definitely stay true to our niche. Everyone who works for us kind of comes from an agricultural or uh, background working in hmm. in uh, kind of that sphere in public policy. So uh, we really are the the technical experts whenever it comes to all things that happen uh, in rural Pennsylvania and can really provide a face to the issue. Um, so often um, our counterparts, not to be negative towards them by any means, but a lot of the things that they're lobbying or working on behalf of, um, they're just kind of the the contract lobbyists. But we really do help to provide provide a, a true story um, and really can showcase and provide that need as to the, the things that we're advocating and lobbying for. Um, we represent some small associations, the whole way up through some large companies. Um, and there's a, a ton of a ton of diversity within our client base. And we keep about 20 plus clients on retainer at any point in time, always up and down depending upon the time of year. Um, and of course, the issues that are at hand at not only in Pennsylvania, but also federally. Hmm. And are all of your clients uh, interested in sort of um, you know, rural issues as far as, uh, you know, are, are all of them looking at that way or that just tends to be the bulk of your clientele? I think we, we found and we have a great way of kind of pulling everyone together that does kind of fit into that niche aspect. For instance, the Pennsylvania Pest Management Association is one of our clients. We don't often think about them being agriculture, but pesticides are regulated by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture in, in the Commonwealth. So they naturally fit into our niche and our relationships, not only with the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, the one and only Mr. Russell, Secretary Russell Redding, but all the way down through the deputies and the people that they work with in the Bureau of Plant Industry. So really it, it does kind of tie into agriculture. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways that, that we can talk about rural America, rural Pennsylvania, and that's just one of them. Um, I will say the one, Almost outlier is Empire Beauty School. It's uh, it's uh, a beauty school um, that has multiple different locations across Pennsylvania, but they were looking for teachers. Uh, my degree is in education. I was an ag teacher. Um, that's where I started my career. So really knowledgeable, I would like to believe, about career and technical education. So um, the fact that they were looking for teachers to come in and support was was a really great fit um, amongst our amongst our firm. So there, I would say there are one non-rural affair client, but still education, still important to, to Pennsylvania. I think what you do, uh, a lot of people, you know, when they're considering career paths, they, they may not think of because it kind of happens, you know, often behind the scenes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, when did you discover that this was like a career option? Honestly, um, I even through college didn't totally realize that this was a career option. Um, this is something that I'll honestly say I stumbled upon. Um, I was asked to a dinner, um, you know, as a, as a college graduate, I'm invited to dinner at the nicest restaurant in State College, um, the Nittany Lion at Penn State. All I had to do was throw a suit on and I immediately RSVP'd yes. Lo and behold, um, the dinner was an honoree. I was, uh, was honoring um, my current boss, um, who was a huge mentor. And um, she was receiving one of the most prestigious awards that the Alumni Society can provide um, to alumni. And, and um, she wanted to bring back the student teachers that were getting ready to go out and student teach. 
Um, so to really expedite that story, connected with her and through some really great connections, um, kept that alive. Um, and even through whenever I was teaching, found a great way um, to, to get a little additional income coming and working and supporting some of her events. Um, I will say first year teachers could always use a little extra money um, in their pocket. So it was a really great way for me to stay not only connected to industry, uh, but to stay connected with a mentor. So um, after a short stint in the classroom, kind of jumped in here. But growing up, and especially in central Pennsylvania, I, I had no idea that um, not only rural policy, agricultural, environmental policy was really a thing, um, but even more so how to get connected with it. I was, right. I, I really had no idea. So I, I did truly luck into an awesome career path this way um, and really enjoy helping encourage folks that are interested, finding ways that they could get started on a, on a similar track. And you are now the COO. Uh, when you were hired, were you hired into that position or did you start uh, in another role and, and you work your way up to it? I did. I actually started in as the COO. Um, like I said, we're a smaller shop. So while a lot of us um, that work here um, are not only working on the advocacy side, a lot of what I do kind of on the back end is really just organization and making sure that what's happening here at the firm is actually moving forward, that we're meeting clients' needs and um, keeping everything on track. Uh, on track. Of course, as a, as a lobbying firm, there's a lot of regulation that we must comply with, um, not only at the state, but the federal level. So make making sure that all of our processes on the back end are meeting those needs and also ensuring that our association management clients and all of our clients are, are truly getting what they're looking for um, at Versant Strategies does play and, and fall into some of my roles and responsibilities. Of course, it's everyone's job to, to keep clients happy, but certainly making sure that there's organization here at Versant um, falls, helps to fall underneath my purview. Yeah, I, I want to ask you a little bit about that because, you know, obviously um, your your mission is to to serve the needs of your clients and, and to keep them happy because you're operating, you know, in a political environment that can be very polarized by by party, can be polarized sometimes by the urban yeah. rural divide. Um, yeah. I, I imagine that there inevitably there's going to be outcomes that don't make them happy. So, you know, how do you manage that? And um, uh, I, I, you know, maybe I'm asking selfishly because I, as a recruiter, sometimes there's outcomes that may, don't make my clients happy. And I'm wondering how, to, how, to, how do you manage that, I guess, with, with client work? Well, I think it all starts with having open lines of communication. Um, for instance, making sure that we are providing and, and working with the the client the way they would best like that to happen. So for instance, if, uh, if we're working with, um, you know, oftentimes a larger company will have one person that's in charge of government relations, and maybe that person has five states, maybe that person has 20 states. Understanding and realizing the way that person best communicates back and, and best operates. Potentially that's a once a week email update and that's perfectly fine unless something important, more important is happening. But I think having realistic expectations and, and identifying what you need as a professional to help meet those expectations is extremely important. Um, for instance, um, at our shop, we do every, generally the first day of the week, today after Memorial Day weekend, we sat down and we reviewed all of the clients, went over everything that was happening and made a sheet um, you know, and, and listed everything that we really wanted to get accomplished through the course of the week. I take a highlighter and check things off. I'm kind of a to-do list kind of guy, but making sure that we're able to provide that deliverable back to the client as necessary, um, appropriate touch points with certain public officials or staff members, um, making sure that we're really finding ways to provide and show the value as to what we're doing certainly helps um, with customer service here. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's easy to think, well, uh, yeah, we're, we're completing the work, we're getting it done, but how are you showcasing that? And how are you sharing that back with the client? Oftentimes helps to increase um, your client's happiness with the work that you're doing. Same amount of work, but just how you showcase it back is oftentimes very important. That is so key. I, I mean, we, we, uh, we're we just kind of, we're not even a third of the way into the 30 under 30, but one thing I've noticed is that people who are finding success early in their career have really uh, become very skilled at project management, which is essentially, you know, you know, what you're describing there of not only being able to get things done in chunks every single week, you know, for yeah. that, but also being able to communicate those steps. Um, I, I think if there's one big insight that, that I'm drawing so far, I think this project management skill set, which isn't taught really in college, 
it's something you've got to kind of either, you know, find for yourself or your employer really has to instill in you. It's, it's so critical and so important. So uh, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about that. Um, what about the bipartisanship aspect? I mean, you you have to you know represent your client's needs, whether that's to someone who happens to be a Republican or happens to be a Democrat or happens to be you know an independent or or, or other uh, party. You know, how, how do you um, manage that without sort of being uh, written off as as one who only uh, you know only gets along with one party? For sure. Um, we, we all have to be honest here. I'm one party affiliation. My boss is a different party affiliation. And of course, whenever we look at public policy, it's so easy to lump that into politics as well as to, you know, kind of the, the role and how everything kind of comes together. I think one thing that I always try to remember is that a lot of the issues that I get to work on, it's not a D issue. It's not an R issue. It's generally an A issue, A for agriculture. And oftentimes what what suits rural America best is not necessarily that partisan issue. Sometimes it's these issues get made partisan, but I think if we, um, you know, one thing I really try to do is, is to strip away the, how are the Democrats going to feel versus how are the Republicans going to feel sometimes whenever I'm truly getting to understand an issue and look at who does this benefit and how does that benefit them? So that what we are able to do is identify and share a story about it. Um, I think being bipartisan in, in how we work and, and not just being bipartisan, but making sure that we're able to talk with people across the aisle ensures that our firm is, is, has longevity. Um, whenever you look at firms that are oftentimes very focused on one party, as that party changes, there's a great opportunity for that firm to lose its credibility. So a lot of what we do is to build relationships with folks on both sides of the aisle. Um, of course, we are always cognizant of what we're doing politically and, and candidates that we're supporting, um, always remembering that that does play a role sometimes in the in the grand scheme and grand picture of things. But I think that, um, you know, really trying to strip away um, that that label of is it a Democrat issue, is it a Republican issue, but finding common ground, um, I think is, has definitely led to a lot of success for us and our clients. Um, and like I said, you know, we oftentimes look at issues not as a D issue or as an R issue, but everyone's an A for agriculture. Um, and we find that a lot of the time um, whenever we truly get down to what's going to support the industry. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Can, can you bring us kind of behind the scenes a little bit? And, and I'm not asking you to kind of give away all the, you know, the, the secret sauce when it comes to strategy. But, uh, you know, how this works when an issue comes in and obviously you have to have those key relationships um, you know, what, what might that look like on a day to day basis? If, if, uh, you sure. know, if you're starting to work on an issue from, from step one, you know, what, at a high level, kind of, how does that, how does that work? For sure. For sure. My, my friends actually joke that all I do is go for coffee and lunch and dinner. So, um, <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Say, yeah, it is a pretty sweet gig that way, but a lot of what we do is building relationships. So we have to remember that there are the folks that are, Kind of on the the back side of the policy that are are in the in the I don't want to say in the trenches but are really there writing the policy and pulling everything together and are on the fish, official side as a lobbyist kind of being on this side of the table you know one thing that's super important for us is the relationships that we mainly maintain not only on the capitol but you know outside with our fellow colleague lobbyists um, but whenever an issue comes into versus let's say we pick up a new client um, the first thing we need to do is really get to the heart of the issue. Not only where does it sit currently in Pennsylvania's legislature, for instance, um, but what are the where does it sit with the regulatory end as well? So, for instance, um, it's a it's a potentially a bill that's already been introduced. We need to go in. We need to research, figure out what's happened. Has this issue been debated in previous sessions? And and so there's a lot of research that goes into that specific issue as a whole. Of course, then there's working with the client and development of um, materials that we're able to potentially distribute or utilize for us to gain background information. So while we are generally technically pretty competent in agriculture, environmental education issues, um, there's a lot of nuances. And um, sometimes whenever we get into the sheer specifics, um, we're, we're talking about nitpicking a lot of the time. So we're always learning more. We're always going back to the client to garner more information. But whenever a client comes on, you know, it's, it's a lot of learning. It's a lot of thinking. It's a lot of developing a strategy. Um, lobbying and public policy is oftentimes a lot of strategy, um, kind of a kind of a game at times, um, figuring out what message you need to create and where you need to get that message heard for you to get the result that you want, whether it's to get a piece of legislation across the finish line or maybe it's to slow a piece of legislation down that could be extremely harmful to rural America or rural Pennsylvania. So 
figuring out what that messaging is, why it is, and, and identifying those key players that need to hear it is is definitely the name of the game um, and something that I find a lot of enjoyment and fulfillment in uh, with what I get to do on a daily basis. Nice. That, yeah, the strategy component seems really, really interesting and dynamic. Mm -hmm. I, I could see where that would be, you know, something that would be, you know, would consume you because there's so many different ways it could, you know, could kind of play out. Um, there are, there are, are. You, are you having to like, when a bill comes in, are you having to like read the whole thing? Cause I've heard these bills can be very, very lengthy. There are in, in Pennsylvania, for instance, there are generally in a, in a two year session. So thinking about every time that we elect our members to the house of representatives, um, the it's a two year session that follows thereafter. So every two years within the state of Pennsylvania, there's about four pieces or excuse me, 4,000 pieces of legislation that are oh, introduced wow. within that two year period. So there's a lot. Will all of them get across the finish line? No. Will all of them get considered? No. So identifying the pieces of legislation that have um, the legs for movement, the potential for movement is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Also identifying and, and understanding, is this of specific interest to any of my clients? Yes, then let's follow it. Um, we pay for a service that helps us track movement, um, track meetings and, and press press events um, that are happening for interest of our clients. But at the same point in time, um, the relationships, as I talked about the value of our relationships, as we start to work on pieces of legislation, the staffers on the Hill, as things start to come around, share some information with us that's certainly helpful, um, which is one of the things that we get to do as a connecting link between our client's issue and the, the Hill is to really be that that connecting link. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of pieces of legislation. I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of critical thinking about this, um, and I do a lot of talking with my client about what if if this is our if this is our prize. Sometimes, what's our what's our second best, um, and what can we live with? So, um, there's there's a lot of conversations thinking about what the not necessarily negotiations, but definitely a lot of reading. Definitely a lot of reading. A lot of thinking. Yeah. So it's, it seems like, you know, a, a big chunk of the job is just figuring out what to dedicate resources to. I mean, you can't do it to a thousand pieces of legislation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We oftentimes think of it like a piggy bank. Um, you really, you have to be putting some goodwill in sometimes to be able to get something out of it. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's how do we invest our clients' political energy, political capital to really get the most bang for their buck? Something that as a lobbyist uh, is extremely important for you to be able to protect. Yeah. Makes sense. You ever run into it where you're like, I've had five coffee meetings. I can't have another <laughs> coffee today. I've had three lunches. I'm, you know, I can't order another sandwich. Um, every once in a while you do get to that point in time. Um, there's some days it's email overload where, you know, 10 o'clock just kind of clipping at things away. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think I, I do find a lot of reward and, uh, and a lot of fulfillment in what I get to do. Um, like I said earlier, I, I never imagined in a million years I'd be doing this. Um, and I, I, I certainly think it's something that I can't take for granted, the opportunity that I have. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for me and um, I really enjoy it. So um, it, it, it's awesome, I will say, that is true. What's what's the hard the hardest part the, the part that you know nobody sees because they think wow you get to have coffee and lunches and dinners all day long but they don't see you know the hard stuff. Ah oh, man, I think just as in every career, there's there's kind of the downside of things. Um, whenever something doesn't go your way and you think it's going to, that that definitely kind of is like a punch in the gut. Yeah. Um, having to kind of having to call a client and provide bad news, I, I think no one enjoys having to do that. And it's the same thing here. Um, you know. I think that um, part of of that hard part is definitely kind of trying to, I, I will say I'm a glass half full kind of guy, which is sometimes rare in, in politics after people are around for a little bit, you, you tend to get a little, people tend to get a little salty sometimes, no offense to anyone, but um, you know, I think so, so really trying to be positive about, you know, what's what's the future um mm -hmm. I, whenever i left my career teaching my mom said are you, are you sure you really want to go work for a small business after you know the, a classroom's pretty pretty safe and you know i said mom there's always going to be a government there's always going to have someone's always going to have a problem with the government i'll always have some sort of job security somewhere somehow so um you know there it's something that's always a continuous movement um, and I think that's also kind of a, a positive and the negative is that um, even if something doesn't necessarily go your way, there's always a chance to go back to the apple for a second bite later. Right. What was the biggest shift for you in going from teaching ag uh, in the classroom to, mm -hmm. to doing this job? There's no bells. 
Um, <laughs> I don't have 25 students first block that I'm teaching freshmen, you know, ag science to. Um, every day is different. And I think I really value that about being in a small business. Um, there's definitely, you know, it's almost a graphic saying, but we ha we do have to kill to eat here. You know, we have to continuously be bringing clients in, doing client development, providing great customer service to maintain our clients, building relationships with folks on the Hill as staff comes and goes, as members come and go, um, that we maintain those relationships to be able to get things done for our clients, not only here in Pennsylvania, but at the federal level. So there's just a constant movement of things and opportunities for us to be able to do. So it, it allows us to have full days every single day. Um, but certainly I think the hardest thing was getting used to the fact that there was no more bell scheduled. There was no consistency, um, in that routine. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of awesome. It's, I've had the best of both worlds in that regard. Cool. Well, uh, what about in building relationships? You know, it's another one where obviously you can go to dinner, you can go to coffee, yeah. you know, is there anything else? And even if it's super tactical that, that works for you when it comes to building kind of client relationships, because most of us watching here are in some sort of, you know, client yeah. service type role. Um, any, any advice or tips or tricks you can give us along those lines? You know, a couple of policies and things that I always like to live by. One is, um, I never type anything that you would not be willing to have on the front page of the New York Times the following day, whether it's a text message or whether it's on social media. Um, if I'm not willing to have someone post it on the New York Times or share it out on AdGrad's uh, Facebook page, you know, I, I don't need to share it. I don't need to post it. I don't need to text it to anyone. I think constantly trying to build goodwill um, is extremely important. Um, you know saying happy birthday to folks with a legitimate happy birthday text is is awesome I, I love getting you know happy birthday you know messages it's something small and it builds goodwill and it helps you to build relationships not only with the people around you um but it, it helps to kind of elevate you as an individual and maintaining that so those little things are extremely important i find in in building client relationships and and, and constantly trying to um, expand that opportunity to have a, expand your network um, you know, I always say never turn down the opportunity to take someone to coffee and always be willing to pay. Um, that's always just a great way to, to get to know someone, to build a relationship, um, and to expand it. it it's crazy how, you know, there's, there's statistics and, and Tim, I'm sure you know them much better than I do, but how, you know, my generation is, is changing jobs at a faster rate than, than generations behind. So think about it this way, the folks that I went to college with are going to network and work with how many folks within the first five years since we graduated, what companies are they going to work for? They're slowly gonna be moving up into man management and into decisions. So even though I think about, you know, oh yeah, I, I hung out with that person at such and such a club and we were friends then, those people are still gonna go and, and be the decision makers of their companies in years to come. So constantly working at maintaining those relationships whenever you see folks is extremely important. Um, you know, we all have bad days, but um, trying to be that positive individual, I think, is extremely important. And I think it, it it bodes well for for the way people perceive you as an individual. Yeah, I think so. And, I, and you're, you're exactly right. I mean, with with the changing landscape and how quickly uh, people do change jobs, mm -hmm. um, whereas maybe paying your dues used to be the currency, you know, the equity that you can build up in your career. Now it really is in those relationships and your ability yeah. to effective, I mean, to get the job done. So, I, yeah, I think that's 100 percent accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, we, we've talked about Harrisburg, you being at the, the state capital there in, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, you're from Pennsylvania, right? Originally? I am. I am born and raised, have never lived outside the state, actually. OK, well, are you being asked at all to do any policy type work on a federal level as well? Or is it all still just focused on on Pennsylvania? We do. We do. So some of the, the clients that we have at Versant, um, are, do have federal, federal interest as well. Oftentimes we'll travel down um, and meet with um, individuals um, from the Pennsylvania delegation. For instance, Congressman Thompson um, has one of the largest physical, largest districts um, on the East Coast. Um, he's a member of the Ag Committee in Pennsylvania and is a, is a good friend um, and a great individual. Um, Senator Casey as well is also on the Ag Committee um, in DC. Um, and we get the opportunity to work with him and Congressman Thompson quite a bit um, in different ways 
ways, um, not only just meetings in, in DC, but also events here in, in Pennsylvania as well. Um, so it's really a great opportunity to help our clients along with, with their federal interests as well. Um, we do have meetings at USDA, Department of Education, and, and um, are constantly building relationships there as well. Um, so we do make it to DC quite a bit. I, I love DC. Um, kind of glad I don't live there full time personally. I do enjoy uh, being in, in a state legislature versus the federal legislature all the time. But um, it's, it's a great place to be. And so um, we do travel down, travel down fairly often. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah I, you're in a bit of a unique situation where, you know, your, your, your first job in doing this, you know, was coming aboard at, at a, you know, a senior level here. What about for those who might be looking at it as either a new career or a career shift into policy? Um, it seems like I always hear about people getting internships in state capitals and places like DC, but I don't really know what the career track looks like beyond that. You know, where, where can somebody, what's the typical starting point after maybe an internship? For sure, for sure. There are a lot of folks that um, get extremely interested in, in law school, um, and that's pretty common um, amongst folks in the public policy circle. Um, certainly not required. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I do did not go to law school and, and are, am not necessarily planning on it at this point in time. Um, but I think finding ways to engage and start to kind of dip your toe in there, if you're a college uh, student and interested, definitely check for internships in DC um, or with even within your state legislature. Sometimes uh, your local congressman or or a senator may have something even back in, in your state or local area that you could definitely check into. Um, don't be afraid of an unpaid opportunity. If you're able to find ways to make it work, sometimes that is um, a, one of your limiting limiting options in this area. But certainly, you know, it, it's a lot about relationships, um, not only within the industry, but also on the Hill. So a lot of times we see folks in public policy circle and move around quite a bit um, based upon those relationships. So um, start networking, um, hang, check out with your with your local congressman or senator and see what opportunities they may be able to provide but also look to trade associations as well um, for instance farm bureau um, and some of the other commodities uh, associations do have opportunities in dc so find something that you're interested in and definitely start checking with those trade associations for opportunities as well there are a lot of oppor uh, a lot of um, places and, and places um uh, places and opportunities for um, beginning positions. Um, if you're willing to, um, you know, kind of get your get your hands dirty and, and really get into the beginnings of it, there, there are opportunities, you know, kind of in that beginning stages in, in DC, sometimes in states, um, but you definitely have to search for them. So uh, they're, they're not always presented right in front of you, but having a good network and, and starting to show interest and in, in meeting with those people is a, is a great opportunity to get started. Cool. You, you obviously, you know, love what you do, uh, but I'm curious, have you come across anyone who this has just not been the right type of work for them? And, and, and what have you noticed about about you know, about that? Just like, hey, for, for whatever reason, if you're like this, maybe this isn't the right type of work for you, generally speaking. Yeah, um, you know, certainly I will say to be a good lobbyist, you have to be an independent person. Um, you know, you really have to be able to think on your feet. Um, you have to be able to be a, a quick learner in certain regards at the fact that um, I'm picking up and juggling, I shouldn't say juggling, but working and supporting multiple different issues at one point in time as well. Um, if you're, if you struggle networking, lobbying may not necessarily be the side of public policy that would be right for you, but certainly, um, you know, if you're, if you love reading, thinking critically about um, legislation and, pol and and laws, regulations, then um, certainly there's always opportunities for, for folks in policy. But um, my job is, as I said, is very social. Um, sometimes it's a little too social and I like to go back and hang with the dog and potentially uh, a, a glass of wine or adult beverage to relax in the evening. Um, but certainly Certainly, you know, there, there is, there's a lot of social aspects to, to what I get to do. So if you like working with people, um, this is definitely something to, to consider. I, I'm really glad to hear you say that because I, I am in the people business as well and spend almost all day long on the phone, but I need to, you know, retreat at the end of the day and have that glass of wine. And, every uh, every uh, once in a while, it's necessary just to completely decompress, watch some horrible show on Netflix um, <laughs> that you don't even care about and just <laughs> Just let it go. Just let it exactly. all go. Yeah. Um, Let, I'm, let's, I'm give, guilty. let's give some shout outs here. You know, what, what's, what's been most or who uh, has been most helpful in you as far as getting to, to uh, your, your current position? Oh my gosh. Um, well, I definitely owe a lot of credibility um, and thanks to my current boss, um, Dr. Misi Baker. She, um, to her credit, is the first female 
actually the only female president of what was NVATA, National Vocational Ag Teachers Association, that is now NAAE, um, first female president and former ag teacher, 20 plus years in the classroom and, and for taking a lot of credit um, and risk in bringing me on to for a guy who had no public policy experience before, but loved agriculture and was willing to work hard. Um, I certainly need to thank um, and credit a lot of work to my mentors. Um, you know, Mr. Eric Calden, um, who's a good friend who helped me get connected. One of those situations where you don't realize that one mentor is as close to another mentor would definitely be the relationship between Eric and Misi. Um, he sent my resume along with a blessing, which was definitely helpful in, in her considering me to come on and do a little bit of work for her um, in the beginning. Um, certainly, you know, there's a lot of mentors and friends that are out there and, and I would hate to miss any of them, but, um, you know, I, I always value the opportunity to send a text message and ask questions, maybe make a phone call as um, folks are having drive time um, and, and pick their brains on thoughts and things like that. So there's a ton of mentors out there and, and probably a lot of them wouldn't even consider them a mentor of mine, but I really do appreciate everyone who I've been able to reach out to and still reach out to. Oh my goodness, I feel like I do it more than I probably should. but. It's always great to hear someone else's opinion on the issues facing you. Right. Well, Caleb, if, if there is anybody watching that says, boy, I would really like this guy representing me in, in the state capitol in Pennsylvania yeah. uh, or federally for that matter, what's a good way that anyone who is paying attention here could uh, follow up with you? Of course. Uh, check out our website, www.versant, V-E-R-S-A-N-T, strategies.net versus uh, versant, meaning uh, having uh, good knowledge and understanding, um, diverse knowledge and understanding. Check us out online. Um, my cell phone number is on there. Always up for a text message, email, phone call at any point in time to discuss public policy, politics, anything involving rural America. It's always an honor and privilege to be able to have good conversation and love being able to do it. Great. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I really, really appreciate you doing this, Caleb. I think uh, there's some fantastic insights here relative to uh, customer service, client relationships, um, project management, and of course, what's going on policy-wise. We'll have to have you back on in the future just to tell us about some of the issues that are going on, uh, because I admittedly uh, do not have uh, quite the understanding of what's happening politically that I probably should. So maybe we'll, we'll get you back on here in the future if you're up for it. Hey, always willing to talk politics and my thoughts on it. Um, luckily, I, you know, I should say unluckily for, for me, but probably luckily for the folks at CNN or NBC or any of those public sources, they don't call me on to commentate. So I always have full, lots of uh, lots of opinions that I haven't shared with anyone else. Well, um, hey, but you're on Red uh, Live. I'm sure CNN <laughs> is calling you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, this is this has been awesome, Tim. It's a true honor and privilege to be able to talk with you. Thanks to you and, and your entire team for everything you're doing, pulling this AgRad 30 under 30 together. It's, you've provided us amazing opportunities to network so far. I'm super excited for the opportunities to further engage with these folks and allowing us to be a resource. I think if we can't uh, leave the woodpile a little bit higher for the folks that are, are looking at opportunities and, and following potentially in our footsteps and what we've done, um, I think we're doing a disservice to ourselves um, to not share our thoughts and stories and, and how we got to be where we are. So I, I'm so thankful for this opportunity and everything that you've done uh, with AgGrad. Um, it's, it's awesome. And I'm, I'm really thankful to be a part of it. Well, you, you are more than deserving, and I appreciate you doing this. You're definitely leaving that wood pile higher than uh, than it used to be. So uh, thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate it, Caleb. If anybody wants to check out Caleb, uh, check out www.versantstrategies.net, right? Awesome. Looks good. All right. Thanks so much, and we're going to sign off. We'll be back next week. Thank you for joining AgGrad Live. Visit aggrad.com. That's A-G-G-R-A-D. To join the community, create your profile, and learn more about careers in the agriculture industry.